just want you to pray for yourself and say, God, we welcome you, Holy Spirit. I want you to say with your mind and say, Holy Spirit, I welcome you. Holy Spirit, I welcome you. If you are in the sanctuary, pray that prayer. Holy Spirit, I welcome you. If you are watching me online, welcome the Holy Spirit to your home. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, it brings the peace of God into every situation. It brings the very peace of God into your heart, into your mind, into your home. Yes, welcome the Holy Spirit right now. Welcome the Holy Spirit right now. Hallelujah. Tell the Holy Spirit, I welcome you. He will hear you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just be silent for a minute. Or drop a few seconds. Just be silent right now. Oh, welcome you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. Come, Spirit of God. Invade our spirits. Invade our hearts. Invade our minds. Saturate us right now. Saturate us right now. Sense the presence of God. We ask you, God, saturate us right now. Each one of us in this sanctuary, in the balcony, Father God, in the homes, and everywhere that people are tuning in, watching us right now. Saturate their minds. Saturate their souls. Saturate their spirits. Thank you, Jesus. Today, I want to talk on the subject, end time distractions. You can write it down, end time distractions. My name is Pastor Gideon Nash. I'm speaking from South Street Baptist Church in Greenwich. Our wife factor group, that is the people from the ages of 10 to 14, 15, 16, I believe they're going downstairs to have their class, the Y factor. Those from the ages of 10 to 15 or so, they are going downstairs by the lift at the back and they are going to have their class right now. But for the rest of us, we're here and people on holidays and as they come, we'll have all our children ministry resource. I'm going to talk about end time distractions. Um, before I get into the subject, I would like to put it in context for you. And then we will get into it. I'm not going to rush this message because it's a very important message. And I'm speaking here for the next four weeks. So I'll have time to continue uh, the various things of it and what God is revealing to me. Um, the context in which I'm preaching this message is since the last Sunday I left church. And as I was going home, I was feeling so, so unwell. And I'm not a medical doctor, but sometimes when you are feeling well, if it is headache, you know what it is. If you're feeling cold, you know what it is. But I was just feeling unwell, and I couldn't place it. And I knew that this is not just an illness that you have to find some medication to sort it out. So I set myself to pray, and I went to sleep, and I just couldn't do anything. I was feeling weak and everything. I didn't understand that. And I slept a bit, and I woke up late in the night, and I started praying. And I prayed for quite a while. In the early hours of the morning, 
I heard a word, distractions, end time distractions. So I said, God, this is a message that you want us to share. So, I mean, just like Apostle John put it in First John chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. He said, what I have seen with my eyes, what I have heard with my ears, what I've handled and what I've behold, I share with you. And I'm sharing what I see, what I behold, what I've heard, what I've handled, because my fellowship is first with the Lord. That means I receive from the Lord. And that which I receive from the Lord, the Bible said, then I will share with each other. Hallelujah. So I'm not talking theories this morning. I'm talking from experience, but also what God is revealing. And I pray that you stay with me. Hallelujah. So let us take our first reading from Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. And this is what it says. And he shall speak, meaning Satan, right? He shall speak great and pompous words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and will think to, that means will intend to change times, that is principles and values and laws, and they shall be given into his hands until the time and times and divided of times. Or from a time, say that, then the saints shall be given into his hands for a time and times and a half of time. That is incredible. And I read it something like this, I'm thinking, what, I mean, what does it mean really, isn't it? I mean, you read it, I'm thinking, what does it mean? So I'm reading this, I'm thinking, what is this, as it were? But then I kept praying, and I just felt the Lord saying, that, get onto a fast, and you understand this. And I'm thinking, I'm reading the book of Daniel. So then, so I set myself to fast from Tuesday up to the Friday, as long as the Spirit of God will allow me to. Then I remembered um, that three years ago, my wife and I went to Supernatural Ministry School in Miami, and we had Apostle Gabriel Maldonado actually speaking on a topic like this. So I went everywhere to scramble for my notes, and I was reading, I'm thinking, but what is this? <laughs> but you know what? God is so grateful, and sometimes you see when a man of God preaches, you hear it, but you don't hear. But then after seeking the face of God, I believe I've heard it. And you see, the book of Daniel, we all probably know a bit about it growing up. As I said, I'm setting this into context so that you understand that. We, we all have, I mean, learned something about the book of Daniel. I'm sure the favorite one is Daniel in the lion's den, right? I'm sure you all know that, don't you? And then some also knows about Daniel's friend, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fairy of fairness, right? Don't we know that? And then if you're a charismatic or Pentecostal, then you know about Daniel's 21 days of fasting, don't you? Right? And if you're somebody who's a little bit more spiritual, then you know a little bit about I mean, Daniel praying and the spirit of kingdom of Persia hindering his prayers from coming true, right? Other than that, what else do you know about Daniel? Um, and, say it again? Yes, he, oh, yeah, of course. He, <laughs> yeah, he, 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 he ate vegetarian, yes. I mean, Sasha, great, he eat more vegetarian, Sasha, uh, uh, Sasha, right? So, he was eating a lot of vegetarian, I mean, vegetarian meals, right? So, we know about that. But you see, the book of Daniel is much, much deeper than that. I remember when I was in the seminary, one of the things that I didn't know that our mind was brought into was that Daniel is, the book of Daniel is one of the apocalyptic writings. What does it mean in simple language? That means one of the books that talks about the end times. Hallelujah. So hence, end time destruction. So one of the books that talks about the end times. But what does it mean by that? You see, the book of Daniel is packed with the life of the saints. God is teaching us that this is how the life of the saint will be. And that was, Daniel was 600 years before Jesus Christ was born. 600 years before Jesus Christ was born. And God was revealing to the church what is going to happen. That the saints of God will come and, uh, and attack 
by the enemy who speak pompous words, great words, even against the most high God. And the whole idea is that he will also wear out the saints. The saints means the Christians. He says in the end times, God revealed to Daniel what is to come. You see, and the end times, when he says, um, what, shall pressure persecute the saints of the most high God and shall intend to change the times and the laws. Move on. Uh, for me to verse 3. And, and the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and a times and half a time. And I'm thinking, what does that mean? Now, from understanding and as the revelation that God is giving me is a period of 2,500 to 3,500 uh, uh, 3, years from the vision of Daniel. And when I put all those together, that's 600 years before Jesus Christ. 2,000 and, and, and what we call it, 2,050 years after Jesus Christ. So think about it, 3,100, right? So the vision that was given to Daniel is for a time like this, where there will be a beast, meaning the enemy, who will speak pompous, great words, disrespectful words, having no connection or having no regard for the faith that we have, and who speak against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High God. And he will intend to change times. Or think of changing times. That means he will change our principles. He will change our values. When we talk about times, that means every period we have the way people behave, people think, people do things. He will change our times. He will change our principles. He will change our values. Not the clock time, but our values, our principles. The things you and me hold dear. And you think about it. The times that we are here. Has not our values, our principles, and the things that we hold dear being changed? Even hasn't our laws being changed? Are we not being told to do things that you know that is against the most high God. And God says this will happen for a time. But it will not be forever. And then the Lord led me to read the whole of the chapter 7 of Daniel. And in fact, as I was reading it yesterday, I must be honest with you, I got scared. Because some of the things in that chapter is scary. And I'm thinking, you mean Daniel saw all these things? No wonder Daniel was disturbed in his spirit. And he went on 21 days of fasting so that he can understand this. He said, God, these things are too much for me. I fell down as flat as dead. He wanted to understand. Because at that time, Daniel was in exile. I'm also still giving you a background to this. Daniel was in exile. And Daniel was serving a very powerful king, Nebuchadnezzar. And during that time... You see, it is only those who will stand up for their faith who will survive. Hallelujah. And God was revealing to Daniel that the time will come that those who will stand up for their faith will survive. And you read Daniel and you come to, say, and you come to understand in chapter 10, it said, and those who know their God will stand and become exploited. Hallelujah. That means they will, they will stand, they will be strengthened, and they will become victorious. So times like this, it is those who know their God that will stand. Otherwise, you compromise your faith. Are you with me so far? And this is what I'm trying to reveal to you to understand. Because me, just like Daniel, I had to go on a fast to understand what this is all about. And during times like this, God is expecting people to stand. And Daniel was able to stand and he transcended all the great empires. He was someone, and when you read chapter 2, the king had a dream of, the, of, Daniel, of Daniel chapter 2. The, the king had a dream, and he didn't understand it, that he was literally going insane by the dream because it was scary for him. But in the dream, Daniel was able to interpret. This is not a subject of my preach right now, but I just want to, to, to understand. And it was, a, I mean, he was talking about kingdoms and nations and powerful empires that will be coming. And he, God revealed to him to the point of our age some of the things that is going to happen. 
And it was quite scary. But at the end of it, if you read, Nebuchadnezzar, the Bible said that he could not sleep. Sleep left him. Even though he wanted to sleep, sleep would not come. Even if he had a sleeping tablet, he would not sleep. He was disturbed. He was going insane. He was having insomnia. That was what it was. And Daniel, what did he do? He called his friends intercession. They gathered together and they started praying. And as they started praying, God gave them interpretation. Or gave them interpretation. And God revealed it to him through vision. So God was trying to tell Daniel about the spiritual things that is supposed to happen. And that was supposed to increase in our times. But also, God revealed to Daniel some of the wicked principalities and powers and the things that is going to oppress people in, at this time of our lives, in our generation, in our times. God was revealing to him. So the book of Daniel is about a whole lot of things and many more. I cannot tell you all it, but at least I can, I can say that when I read chapter 7, I was thinking, oh God, just like chapter 2, you see at the end of the day, the kingdom of our God going to, came to smash all the kingdoms and the empires and the authorities and the powers that was before it because our Jesus is powerful. Hallelujah. And you read chapter 7, and as I was getting a little bit scared, I must say I was because it was frightening. I mean, what the fourth beast looked like. There's, there's something deeply spiritual in our time, more wicked than has ever been. Hallelujah. Because people don't understand. People don't understand scripture. They will just, I mean, poo-poo this. And sometimes I sit and I'm thinking, I have to poo-poo you. Because a year by this time, most of you were so scared you think you were going to die. Because there was a virus you couldn't see. But some of us who knew our God, we were not scared the least. Hallelujah. So if you say there's no spiritual world, you are in trouble. But I just want you to know that this is absolutely so true. So Daniel, 600 years before Jesus Christ, we are talking about 3,000 years before he knew. He said, this time there's going to be a beast that released that is more dangerous. That's more dangerous that he can even transcend that which has passed. And we'll be speaking profane things. We'll be changing our laws. We'll be pompous. We'll be antichrist spirit. That's what Daniel is saying in this one verse. There's going to be an antichrist spirit. There's going to be a spirit that is challenging our faith. And it's only those who are strong who will stand. But the amazing thing about it, as you continue to read from verse 28 onwards, say that, look, but our God, the Most High, would triumph over this. Amen. Hallelujah. That gave me an assurance. I'm going to talk about end time distractions. So in times like this, I want you to understand that the enemy is more stronger than before. And God saw that. The power of the evil supernatural is bigger, mightier, and more devastating than it's ever been. And we are in this situation. And a lot of people are walking blind. They don't see. They don't believe. They don't hear. Unbelief is part of the work of the enemy. If you don't believe, you don't take action. But thank God we believe. That's why I'm extremely grateful to God. That I mean, for South Street Baptist Church, in a time like this, God has visited us in the supernatural way and has given us fresh revelation of his word. So, one of the strategies of the enemy in the end times is distractions. The main purpose is to wear down the saints. Write them down. One of the strategies of the enemy in the end times is, is distractions. The main purpose is to wear down the saints. So today my objective, as I'm speaking to you, is that I will expose the end time distractions, the purpose, and learn how we can overcome that I want to expose your mind, open your mind to what are end time distractions, the purpose of end time distractions, and how to overcome them. That means times that you and me are in, the distractions that we go through. So I just want you to understand that it's not only distractions, but we go through distractions, accusations, criticisms, disappointments, oppression, and many more. All these are used by the enemy in the end time, especially against the saints. That means the Christians. 
those who have given their life to Jesus Christ, those who said, God, we want to walk with you, they are under attack most. For those who don't know Jesus Christ, we know that the enemy has got their number. And they, when they, they said, oh, we okay, we fine, we fine. And at the point of that is when they know that they are not fine, and that time is so late. Do you understand that? That is why you and me need to have a lot of compassion. That's why you and me should have a lot of love. That's why you and me need to be urgent to tell people about Jesus Christ, that we are in the end times and there is something that is going to damage them. There's so much mental illness in our nations. There's so much sicknesses in our nations, and yet there are so many doctors and there are so many psychiatrists. There's so many sin in our nations, and yet we say we are a Christian country. There's so many things that are really against the will of God, and yet we are here, and Christians are falling apart, and yet they said they know their God. What do you think is happening? There's something spiritual happening. And Daniel saw that. Daniel said, God, if you reveal this to me, I don't want it to go away. I want to understand what it means. So he put himself through fasting. Don't worry, he's allowed to cough. Otherwise, pray for, for him to be healed. So, well, I just want you to understand. Daniel said, I will not let this go until I understand that. So today, I pray that you will not let this message pass by you, but you want to understand so that you know what to do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The purpose of this is to wear you down. Yeah? Disappointment, oppression, criticism, discouragement, and, and, and distractions and accusations. The purpose is to wear you down. And there are strategies of the enemy. God doesn't do that. For example, sometimes you have a problem. It could be something so small, and yet you are not able to have a breakthrough or find your way out. And be thinking, what is that? These are end time distractions and end time strategies. So, write this one down. What is a distraction? What is a distraction? You may think it is obvious, but of, of course it is obvious, so that's why I want you to write it down. What is a distraction? Distractions are anything. That prevents you from achieving your destiny, your goal, your calling, or your purpose in life. Distractions are anything that prevents you from achieving your destiny, your goal, your calling, or your purpose in life. Distraction can be a person, can be a thing, can be a place. In other words, distractions come in the form of a place, in the form of a person, in the form of a thing. That means that any of these avenues the enemy can use to distract you, to prevent you from achieving your destiny, your goal, your purpose. You have an ambition in life. What's something that you want to achieve? But something will come to prevent it. You have a goal in life. God has given you a destiny and a purpose as to what he wants to because each one of us have a destiny. That means we are going somewhere. We're not just walking through this phase of this earth and then die. So what's the point in being born and then you just grow up, go through all the challenges of life and some happiness here and there and then you die? Is that all that life is about? No, life is about more than that. Hallelujah. And you have to find that purpose. You've got to find that destiny and you have to know God and speak to him intimately, and God will reveal your purpose, your destiny, and your life to you. Hallelujah. So when something is preventing that goal, your destiny, your calling, then you know that this is, that's, this is not from God, and therefore I'm not having it. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And it can be through a person. It can be because of where you are or something that has come in your way to distract you. Distractions occur especially when you are doing something for God. You come against criticisms that might upset you or a discouragement that may make you feel like, I don't want to go on. Or sometimes something put fear in you. And in that way, if you are not careful, you stop taking initiatives to achieve your purpose. You know that you are an achiever. You know that you're able to do something. But fear is preventing you from doing it. Maybe because somebody criticized you. Because somebody did something to discourage you. Because somebody said something against you. Or something 
literally was a hindrance to you or because of the place that you are. Something is not working for you. These are distractions. They occur to upset you. They occur to discourage you. They occur to put fear in you so that you stop taking the initiative to achieve your purpose. The enemy uses such repeated cycles <clears throat> to great effect. And unless you become aware of these strategies, you become discouraged and give up. Amen? Have you been in the place that sometimes you feel like giving up? Have you gone through certain things that you think, oh God, I'm, I think I have to give up. And then when you give up, he's got your number. Hallelujah. Because what we read is that the enemy will come and speak pompous. That means he's actually bold and challenging and, and have no shame. He's thinking, I am in charge. I am going to mess up their lives. And he speaks this boldly even to the Most High God. And he wants to wear out. He said, I'm going to wear out the saints. But then we have to know so that he cannot wear us out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, I mean, sometimes people don't understand that a lot of people have hidden behind Corona to stop their faith in God. Right? That is a strategy of the enemy. Having had the worst of the virus attack, I can assure you that this virus is not only medical, but also a deeply spiritual disease or illness or whatever it is. It has a spiritual connotation to it. And I've told you before that it got to a point that I couldn't breathe. That my throat was literally locked up. And I felt like there's a lump in my throat that I put my hand in my throat to pull it out and there was nothing. And you tell me what are we dealing with. Hallelujah. There was a time that I felt, I mean, I, my family would tell you that they come to my room to sanitize every other day. Change my bed sheet every other day. And they tiptoe to come in. And my eyes were open. I was watching them, but I couldn't say much. I was just watching them, thinking in my head, what's the matter with them? The reality is that they said they were worried that one day they would come and find me dead because the whole room smells like death. So if anyone has seen this virus, I have seen it more than most of you. And I have seen it when I walk through the valley of shadow of death and so yet alive. And I know God spoke to me through that time. Revelation chapter 1 verse 17 and 18. He said, I'm alive forever and ever. I have authority over death. So a few phone calls that I managed to pick up. They said, Gideon, how are you doing? First thing I said, I'm alive forever and ever. I have authority over death. That's all what I was saying. And through that, I saw myself walking through the valley of shadow of death. I was hugging family and friends that I knew who were dead and dead and gone. I was hugging them, and I said, no, I can't be with you. And I had to leave some of them, and they were crying. I'm thinking, some of these people died without being fulfilled. Are you hearing me? So I am talking as somebody who has seen death, not once, twice or more, and come back to life. And therefore, when I'm speaking, I speak with authority. And I have no fears. I may be criticized, but I know that's an end time strategy because people who criticize me haven't seen anything yet. You see, so here we are. So these cycles the enemy brings over us. So for me, why I digress a little bit is to challenge you that after giving Corona as an example, as an excuse not to be in church, now the restrictions are removed. What is your excuse? Now the virus is a little bit below, I mean, a little bit tame because we found some medical conditions to it. And may I say that if you have even double, I mean, have your jabs if you haven't had it, I mean, and if you feel comfortable, do it, right? Because apparently when you have it, then when for any reason, I mean, the virus attack you, then there's a very good chance that you will live. Do you understand that? You have a better chance to live. Because I've heard about a few people who've had a jabs and so, yet had the virus, and they recovered. But when it happened, people were not recovering. They were dying like flies. And you know that country, about 60, uh, what, 6 million people have been affected by the virus, and 300,000 nearly have died as a result of that. So the virus is real. If you are sitting here and you think it's not real, then there's something wrong with you. So I just want you to understand that. So let me pull back to the subject that I'm, re I'm, I'm saying. 
So I'm saying that the enemy distracts us. So coronavirus has been a distraction for many to leave the faith or to stay at home or not to connect with God. That's the, sub, that's the, I mean, the conclusion of my digression. You understand that? So people have no excuse and they don't know what hit them. They don't know why they are not connecting with God. That's distraction because the idea that the enemy has worn them out. Do you understand that? He's worn them out. So, the idea that we have as a church that God has been with us and revealed himself to us tells us that even if the enemy wants to wear us out or cause us burnout, we will not end up leaving the faith, but we will still be strong and become exploit. Hallelujah, Lord. See, distractions are an end time strategies over young people, over adults, and anyone who wants to do something for God, or a child of God who wants to achieve something for himself or herself. You see, just put yourself to want to serve God. And you know what? The enemy will distract you and ask yourself, you were serving God yesterday, so why aren't you serving God today? And I know some were serving God yesterday, and where are they that they weren't? Not only in my church, I hear it in many churches. I talk to pastors. Distraction, distraction, distraction. To wear them out. To burn them out. To prevent them from actually doing what they had to do. So it can, it's a strategy of the enemy against the young people, against adults, and anyone who wants to do something for God. Distractions work mainly in immature people. Or those lacking discernment. Are you hearing me? Mainly, that doesn't mean solely, but mainly in immature people and those lacking discernment. You see, so I knew from praying and from seeking God's face that what I was feeling for days last week was a distraction. Hallelujah. Was a distraction from doing what I ought to be doing because I get busy when I'm ministering. If you are not mature spiritually, distractions will be a very effective tool of the enemy against you. Do you get that? And distraction will come in the form of a place, a person, or a thing. So what is the purpose of distraction? I have six points, but I can assure that I will not go through all the six points, but we'll continue next week, right? So let's write something down. What is the purpose of distraction? You may, it's obvious, number one. The purpose is to wear down the saints. Write it down. To wear down the saints. You see, the wearing out is the tool to get to burn out. If the enemy can wear you out, frustrate you, then you'll be burnt out. You become tired and lose your focus. Do you get that? You become tired and lose your focus. Thankfully, we have a system in this church that we give our ministry, those in ministry time, that, I mean, at a rotation, you can take about two to four weeks off that you don't minister so that you will not be burnt out. But I just want you to know that the enemy wants to wear you out, and that will lead you to burn out. Because the wearing out is to really frustrate you, is really to bring some, I mean, maybe a person before you to criticize you, a person in front of I me, mean, or I mean, before you who probably didn't say thank you for what you have done, or maybe, I mean, say something or cross your path. It can be anything, it can be a thing that you want, maybe a tool to work with, and it's not there. The purpose is to wear you down. Number two, what is the purpose of distractions? To prevent you from getting what you set out to achieve. That means to prevent you from getting, achieving your goal. The purpose of distraction is to prevent you from achieving your goal. You see, very few people set out in life that they just, I am just living. I want to eat. I want to sleep. I want to play. I want to work with no purpose. Very few people are like that. 
But majority of people, significant majority of people have a goal in life. Maybe they want to buy a car. Maybe they want to buy a house. Maybe they want to have an investment. Maybe they want to have good clothes. They want to go on holidays. Maybe they want to paint their house. They have a vision. So you can see that you don't fit into that category because you have a vision. You have a goal. And the enemy's distraction of, I mean, purpose of distraction is to prevent you from achieving that goal. All distractions is to prevent a goal. That means to prevent your dream from coming true, your vision, your target, your purpose, etc., or your destiny to be obtained. All distractions is to prevent you from achieving your goal or reaching your destiny. There's an enemy out there that wants to stop you from achieving that goal. And that is absolutely true. So Daniel understood that. Daniel was a teenager when he went to Babylon. He wasn't even 20. By the time he was 21, he was a prime minister of a very powerful land, and yet he was a foreigner. Right? He was a foreigner. And yet he was the prime minister of a nation. And his three friends were secretaries of state in Babylon. That's incredible, isn't it? Because God was with him. And this guy, as a teenager, learned to fast. He learned to say, I will not eat of the king's food, choice food, but I will rather eat, I mean, I will rather fast and wait upon my Lord, and my Lord will give me wisdom, my Lord will give me knowledge, and my Lord will see me through. At the end of two years, Daniel and his friends were more, the Bible said they would look more beautiful, right? Their skins were smooth and nicer. I mean, probably have some cheeks. I'm just adding it up, right? So literally, they look better than the others. They were 10 times wiser. Go and read it from Daniel chapter 1 and you see it. They were 10 times wiser and knowledgeable. They understood all the mysteries of Babylon within two years. That was incredible, isn't it? They understood all the language and the literature. They understood all the laws. And you understand they were made satraps. That means they were made chief ministers of the land. So what I'm trying to say is that whether you're a young man or I mean an adult or a grown-up, you should understand that God, if you, are, if, he, if you align yourself with the purpose of God, he's able to make you much better than you've even thought of you will be. He'll make you much better than the person sitting next to you. He'll make you, he'll make you much better than the people who are competing with you. Because that is what God does with his people. In an end time like this, God wants his sons and daughters to be like that so that we will not be prevented from achieving our goal and our destiny. Hallelujah. Sometimes a person is on fire for God, growing, serving God. Some even hungry for God and suddenly get distracted. But at what point do they get distracted, you may ask? At what point? When they lose their focus. Hallelujah. When they lose their focus. So turn around and tell somebody that don't lose your focus. I want to see you doing that. If online, turn to somebody in your home and tell them, don't lose your focus. Is that, so when you lose your focus, then you get distracted. You've got to be single-minded as to what you want to achieve. You've got to be single-minded on God, the God that you, uh, the most high God that you serve. And he will be with you. The most reassuring phrase that you can read in the Bible said, I will be with you. I am your God. I will be with you. I will help you. I will be with you. I will help you. And we see that in the book of Daniel, it said God was with Daniel and his friends. But the mo most high God was with Daniel and his friends. Even the, even, the, even, the, even the kings were saying that no one should worship any other God except for the God of Daniel because there's no other God than him. These people were saying that. Hallelujah. Because they did not lose their focus. And Daniel served all the kings. He served three empires. He served the Babylonian Empire, which was succeeded by the uh, uh, Middle Persian Empire, right, the Medes, and then, of course, the Persian Empire, which was the most powerful and the largest, occupied the whole of North Africa, all, all of Eastern Europe, 
to the boundaries of Greece, Asia, and all those places, 127 provinces, massive area. And Daniel was there, chief minister. This is incredible, isn't it? Because he did not lose his focus. And he lived for 110 years. That's incredible, isn't it? Sometimes people who don't lose their focus live for a long time. Right? Like the Joseph in the Bible. You know what he, how he became a prime minister in Egypt? And you know about I mean, uh, uh, Joshua in the Bible. They all live for 110 years. Let me move on and talk about a third point, and then I will stop, and we'll continue next week. Is that okay? Hallelujah. Are you happy with that? Yes. Amen. He said, now, what is the purpose of distractions? It's to lose your conviction. The purpose of distraction, the purpose of the enemy boasting and persecuting the saints of the Most High God and to change our laws and to change our principles and the values is that he wants to, you to lose your conviction. Are you with me? I'm trying to connect the verse for you. He wants to, you to lose your conviction. That's why he's changing your laws. That's why he's changing your principles and values. That's why our values are being degraded. That is why everything goes for us. That's why people don't want God anymore. That's why we don't even feel Christian. We don't even energize to tell people that, look, this is a, a massive place that God can help you. This is a place that when you come, we can pray for you. We can heal you spiritually. If when medically you can't be healed, we can do that. This is a place that we can actually bring I mean, emotional healing. This is a place that you can have deliverance. This is a place that God can be. This is a place that there are good people who will stand shoulder to shoulder with you when you're going through difficulties. This is a good place to be. But the enemy wants you to lose that conviction. Let's read Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. It says, being confident of this very high, th very thin. Right? Being confident of this very thin, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day, hallelujah, of Jesus Christ. You see, being confident of this very thing, that another translation said, having the conviction of this, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. That means God who has saved you and me and begun a good work in us, whatever good work that God has begun in you, he will complete. If he's given you a good job, it is in his purpose to see you through it so that you will not lose it when it is not due to lose it. Lose it. If he's given you a good business, it is his purpose and it is will for it to succeed and thrive and for business not to go down and for you to actually walk in misery. And if it is his, it is his purpose for you to walk in health, all these things, some Christians think that it's okay if you are sick, then oh God wants you to be sick to humble you. What have you done to God that he wants to humble you? Hmm? Tell me, what have you done to him that he had to humble you? Of all the people in the world, it is only you that he wants to humble. God doesn't do that. So I just want you to know that it is, he, if, when he starts a good work in you, he will make sure that he will complete it until Jesus Christ comes again, on the day of Jesus Christ. So, he said, hold on to your conviction. Have this conviction strong in you. Don't let the enemy take your convictions about your faith, convictions about your purpose, convictions about your goal, convi convictions about your destiny. Don't let anybody take it away. It can be a person, it can be a place, it can be a thing that wants to take it away. That is distraction. Hallelujah. You see, you get distracted from your purpose, your call, or your goals in life when you lose your conviction of your focus. Another way to look at distraction is being out of focus. If you are distracted, that means you are out of focus. It's like a camera, right? If the camera is out of focus, you don't see nothing. There's something there, not that you see is what some wheezy, wheezy things. And I hope... Uh, Zion, my great cameraman today, will make sure that I'm not out of focus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Zion. So here, you see, so distractions is being out of focus. If you are not being focused, you lose your conviction of your purpose, your call, or your assignment. 
You see, those who are not focused, who are out of focus, they lose their conviction. They are not even convicted. That means they are not even sure of what they are doing. They don't see what they are doing. I am convinced and convinced in the faith that I have. I am convinced in the ministry that I have to the point that I had to leave my professional career and said I will be a preacher full time because I am convinced that this is my calling. Hallelujah. And as time goes on, it has been proven that that is the right thing, right conviction that I have. And I have no reason to be out of focus. It's in my blood. And thank God I have a family who also convict. They have the same conviction that he who has begun a good work who will complete it. Hallelujah. And some of you are convicted in that way. Even your language is changing. And God is releasing you in a powerful way that you do a lot of things. At this point, distraction becomes easy. When you've lost your convictions, distraction becomes easy. For example, you have a young, beautiful lady, which we have many in this church, in university or college, and they see a young man who come into their life, and they lose their focus and their conviction of that person. Don't do it. Hallelujah. I'm not saying if you see a man, don't see that person, right? Open your eyes, because... I would love the women in this church who want to get married to get married. It's a good thing. Yeah? Even Apostle Paul tells us, even though he was not married. So I'm for marriage. It's a good thing. If you find somebody good, somebody who knows God, somebody who is filled with the Holy Spirit, somebody who is convicted of, of, of his faith or her faith, then please, if God is leading you, marry that person. Don't go and just pick somebody on the road. I always say that, look, it's not like London buses that the next one will come so easily. When you're on fire for God and something like failure, difficulty, say in marriage or death, children making wrong choices, sickness has happened to you, you can be distracted. Another example, when you are praying and you have your phone beside you, which is normal these days, a call or a text message comes in and you get distracted and decide to check it. The next thing you see, you're actually checking your Instagram your Facebook, I think then you, you lose your conviction of what you are praying for. How can you expect God to answer your prayers? When you put him aside to listen to and, and chat with your Facebook, by the time you realize, you spend 30 minutes, one hour, chatting with your Facebook, and then when you come, oh God, my time is up, I need to go to work. Then you get up and you go. Yes, these are end time distractions. You have no conviction and that means you are losing your conviction. May I ask you, guys, I'm asking you church, online, family, I am asking you, those in this sanctuary, in the upper room, I am asking you, what are you here for? What are your goals in life? What are your assignments in life? Have you thought about it? I repeat those questions, and I want you to think about it. What are you here for? Not necessarily in this church. What are you here on this earth for? Why are you here? What are your goals in life? What are your assignment in life? You see, a lot of people who get distracted in church is because they lose their conviction as what their goal, their calling their purpose and their assignment is. They lose their conviction of what their assignment is simply because they do not focus on what God is saying or what God is telling them. And I just want you to know that there's always a price to pay for these things. And we'll continue this message next week. And I'm so excited about what is coming next week. And I hope that you'll be excited. You will not miss it. And you come next week and you come and you bring somebody with you so that they can come and understand that we are in the times in our generation that the spirit of the Antichrist, the spirit of the beast, the fourth beast, go to Daniel chapter 7 and read it. The fourth beast is more dangerous than the three beasts that had come before its time. The beast means the devil, right? And that is bad enough. And the devil is not just a person that is standing there. Things that affect kingdoms and systems. Do you understand that? 
it affects kingdom and systems. Kingdoms means uh, uh, it, it not only territorial, I mean, first is territory, but then secondly, the power behind it. Do you get that? Because United Kingdom will never be a United Kingdom if it has no power. Nobody will care about it. That's why some countries, nobody even know about them. They're not kingdoms. You see, kingdoms come with power and authority and wealth. So, the whole idea of end time is that the beasts affect kingdoms. The wealth, the power, the people. It affects the mindset. We are talking about kingdoms and then systems. The systems are the things that are in place to make us live well and live good and enjoy it. It affects it and it messes up things for us. It includes our health. It includes our social care. It includes our emotional well-being. It includes so many things. We are talking about kingdoms and systems. Are you learning something today? You see, that is what the enemy is doing. So sit down and look around yourself. That what is the enemy affecting? What is changing? What is has changed since you started growing up and went to primary school? What has changed since you were born? What has changed? What is changing? What is the future like? Hallelujah. We are in the end times. And I don't want any of you to leave here today going home. I do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Or sitting exactly where you are and you know you're backslidden or you know that you haven't actually grown. You know that you are distracted and confused and you're still doing nothing about it. Hey, today God brought you here and today if you are listening to me online, God brought you here to listen to Pastor Gideon Knight from South Baptist Church for a reason. God brought you here to bless you and today I want to pray for you. I want to pray for the musicians. Please hurry up a little bit. I want to pray for you in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I want us to stand. You've been sat for about 45 minutes now, so you can stand now. Right. Hallelujah. 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 In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. See, first, I want to be brave and appeal to you. That if you are here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or even if you are online listening to me, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to raise up your hand. Don't be afraid. This is a good thing to help you to know God seriously. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to know that the beast has got your number. And you want to get out of his grip. On the other hand, if you know Jesus Christ, but you know that you are not intimate with God and your connection with God is loose. You know you've been distracted. I want you to wave at me. I'm not going to shame you. I'm just going to pray for you. It's all about you and about Jesus, not about me. If this is you, just wave at me and I'm going to help you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Don't be afraid. Be brave. Be bold because the beast is bold and is there to mess you up. So if it is you, just wave at me one more time. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Father God, I pray for these that have waved at me. They are waving this unto the Lord. Father God, I pray that you yourself right now bring them back into a relationship and fellowship with Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for restoration for them. I pray for a cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ so that they will be reconciled to God. But I pray that, oh God, that Father, today they will receive refreshing of their souls and that they will be in that place. That Father God, they will look up to you and know that Father God, you will give them fresh vision to move on. Father God, I thank you for their lives in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Now for the rest of you as a church, I want you to pray. And I want you to pray a prayer of repentance before God for becoming distracted. I have been distracted. As I said last Sunday, for two days I felt so ill. I was distracted. I didn't even know what to do. But thank God I could pray. I do get distracted every now and then. And I'm sure you do too. So today I pray because the reason why we get distracted is because there's an enemy 
who want to wear you and me out. Make us out of focus. Not to achieve our destiny. So tell God, God, I'm sorry that I've become distracted. That I've lost my conviction. That I'm losing my focus. Tell God that you have allowed yourself that way. Sometimes you don't even have to, but the enemy will do that because he wants to prevent you from having what you have to have. Pray that prayer now. We pray for you right now. Pray a prayer of deliverance for you. Pray. Make sure that you're asking for repentance because when you speak, God hears. I'm not saying meditate. That means pray in your mind. If I'm a human being and you are talking to me, you open your mouth so that I can hear you. And God says, let prayers be made. At all times, let us not cease to pray. So right now, pray to God and ask God. And say, God, I'm sorry that I allow myself to be distracted. I am sorry. I see myself in distraction. I am sorry that today you're going to give me a chance to come back. And I'm ready. God, I'm sorry that I've lost my focus and I've lost my vision. I've lost my conviction during this time of coronavirus pandemic. And if you pray that prayer, I'm going to pray for you right now. Father God, today I pray for your church right now. Your church, the family online and the family here in this sanctuary and the upper, uh, upper balcony. Father, I'm praying in the name of Jesus. And Father God, I stand in the authority of Jesus Christ, the resurrected Christ. The anointed one, I stand in that authority and Father God, I declare deliverance. Father, I set your people free from the power of destruction, from the spirit of the enemy. I set them free in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, I release them, I release them, I release them. Anything causing their destruction, be it illness, Father God, be it my problems, Father God, be it financial problems, be it busyness, Father, whatever it is, oh God, I pray and I deliver them out of that in Jesus' name. Father, be it fear, anxiety, discouragement, criticisms. Father God, whichever way, Father God, that the enemy has attacked them. Today I pray in Jesus' name that they will be set free. Hallelujah, Lord. Father God, I pray in your name that your children shall be delivered. You said in my sign we shall find deliverance. That means in the church, deliverance will come. And today, the church of Christ, today, receive your deliverance from destruction. Right now, right now, right now, in Jesus' name. Amen. And before you sit down, before you sing the next song, I want you to pray after me. That means I'm praying and you repeat that after me with conviction. Dear Lord Jesus, today, I thank you for your word. And I thank you for the exposition of the works of the evil one in these end times. Today, I am ready not to be distracted in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, help me to focus and know who I am. Today, I am committed to focus on the Lord Jesus. I am committed today to focus on my goal. I am committed today to focus on my destiny. I refuse to lose my conviction in the name of Jesus. Today, I call my destiny to come. Today, I call my goals to crystallize in my hands. In the name of Jesus, Father, I thank you for dying on the cross for me to restore my life and give me a chance to be with you and to inherit my destiny and my purpose and my goal and my calling. In the name of Jesus Christ, shall we praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Lord.